Good morning. This is Marshall Davis, and it's a nice warm day in New Hampshire. All of a sudden, summer has come. Uh, two weeks ago, it was snowing, and the last three days, it's been in the 80s. So I'm outside, recording this outside for the first time. So you will hear outside noises. You'll be hearing vehicles going by and birds in the background and so forth. So that's uh, the way it is. Uh, Today I'm going to be talking again about the non-dual teachings of Jesus and uh, one in particular. It's one of the most famous sayings of Jesus and one of his clearest teachings on the self and non-duality. It is found in all four Gospels, which is extremely rare. Uh, you almost never find the same words in John's Gospel as you do in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when in this case you do. In fact, it may be the only instance of it. Uh, that nearly guarantees that it's one of the, the central teachings of Jesus because it was one of the most remembered ones. Here it is in four different forms from the four different Gospels. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will find it. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life will keep it for eternal life. Here's the longer form of, of it, a little bit of context. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, for whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit the soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for his soul? In all these sayings, Jesus is talking about moving from identifying with one's temporary human self, and instead finding one's identity in the eternal or true self. Now, to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here, it's important to know the word that is translated both life and soul in these verses. The Greek word is suke. The word is transliterated into the English language as the word psyche, and that helps to explain it. It is our psyche, our psychological self. It is our human sense of personal identity. It's what we usually refer to with the words me, myself, or I. People used to use the word soul to refer to human beings, and it's still rarely used in that sense today when it says that a, a plane or a ship goes down with so many souls on board by using that word that did not mean so many spiritual entities inhabiting bodies. They meant persons. And when the Gospels use the word suke, they ref are referring to persons, to the human sense of being an individual personal self that is perceived as different and separate from all the other personal selves. When Jesus talks about losing or saving our self or our soul or our life, he's talking about that sense of personal identity. It's the same sense of identity that has dominated human consciousness from the beginning of human evolution. Very early in infancy, we learn to be a separate self. We are not born with that sense of identity, but we learn it from other human beings in the first couple of years of life as a way to function in human society. <coughs> We develop a separate personality that we identify with our physical bodies, which is different than all the other personalities and bodies around us. This self-consciousness is the product of our brains and developed through the process of evolution. It helped our species survive and dominate this planet and achieve dominion over the species of the earth, as the book of Genesis puts it. It is a reason for the evolutionary success of Homo sapiens. It's also the cause of our psychological suffering, our feelings of isolation and anxiety and other negative emotions. And it 
can cause mental illness and neuroses that make life hell for people, leading to depression and suicide. It also leads us to look for some type of escape from this suffering, this inner hell. We search for inner peace and joy and happiness and release from all the side effects of being a separate self. Jesus proclaimed a gospel of freedom from this self. He called it the kingdom of God. Now it has nothing to do with the later Christian gospel involving the promise of heaven through the human sacrifice of a Galilean carpenter. That was developed by the Apostle Paul and became the dominant theology of the church. But Jesus did not preach that. Jesus preached a way for us to be saved from ourselves by dying to self and thereby finding our true self, which is eternal life. He shared a way to be liberated from suffering, including the guilt and shame and fear that religious people like the Pharisees loved to pile on people. Liberation is found by losing ourselves and finding our self, capital S. Exchanging a false identity for a true one we lose the temporary separate personal identity, which has been crafted by our brains in exchange for a permanent, eternal, uncreated identity in God. Christians call this union with Christ. Other traditions use other terms. It doesn't matter what we call it. What matters is that we see that we are one. If we try to preserve and protect ourselves, our human selves, then we forfeit our eternal selves. What good is it, Jesus said, if we gain the whole world and lose eternal life? But if we take up our cross and follow Jesus and allow that self to die, then we will paradoxically save our lives. The little psychological self is doomed in any case. It cannot survive the death of the body because it's nothing more than a figment of the imagination, literally the creation of our minds. And if we cling to that as who we really are, then we're lost. But if we cease to identify with it, then we are free to be who we really are. We awaken to our true nature. We are one with the eternal one of the universe, whom we call God. We are one with the word of God, whom we call the eternal or universal Christ, who John says was with God in the beginning and who was God. As Paul said in one of his moments of clarity, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We are found to be in Christ as Paul says, and Christ is in us, as he also says, because you see, the Apostle Paul knew this reality too. It's clearly there in his writings, but it's overshadowed by his theology, which he became preoccupied with. Theology is just ideas in the mind. Paul can never completely overcome that, overcome that inner Pharisee. He felt the need to codify God and theological ideas and ethical rules. But truth is not ideas or rules. Those are dualistic. God is non-dual. When we give up our separate selves, then we gain everything. Because then we are one with everything. When we lose ourselves, we find our lives in God. When we are willing to give up our souls, then, as the old hymn says, our soul finds a resting place, not in a man-made creed. When we lose our little separate souls, then we gain the world soul, as Plato referred to it. The suke cosmo, the anima mundi in Latin. It is our true self. Then we see this as always what we were. It is a soul exchange, if you want to think of it that way. And it's a really good deal, even from a practical point of view, although it's hard for the ego 
to accept that because all it sees is non-existence. We give up something temporary and man-made to gain what is permanent and eternal. As Jim Elliot famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. When the old self dies, then resurrection happens. But we cannot imagine what that resurrection entails until we die. When we die before we die, then we inherit eternal life here and now. This is the kingdom of God. This is unitive awareness. This is Christian non-duality. That is it for today. Grace and peace to you.